Um, I'd like to thank the Vedic Cultural Society for the invitation to speak to you tonight about uh, my book, Forbidden Archaeology, which gives a Vedic perspective on human origins and antiquity. <clears throat> so, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself as a researcher in history and philosophy of science for the Bhaktivedanta Institute. And that is the science studies branch of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. <clears throat> the purpose of the Institute is to study concepts of modern science in light of India's timeless Vedic wisdom. So the talk I'm going to give tonight is based on talks that I've given at the Royal Institution in London, the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow, and other scientific institutions, conferences, and universities throughout the world. My research into human origins and antiquity is guided by my studies in the ancient Sanskrit writings of India. And these writings tell us that human civilizations have come and gone on this planet for vast periods of cyclical time. Uh, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about this Vedic concept of cyclical time, you can consult this uh, paper which I presented at the World Archaeological Congress and it was later published in a peer-reviewed conference proceedings volume. <clears throat> the basic unit of Vedic cyclical time is called the day of Brahma or the Kalpa. This day of Brahma lasts for 4,320,000,000 years. It's followed by a night of Brahma which also lasts for 4,320,000,000 years. And the days follow the nights endlessly in succession. And during the days of Brahma life, including human life, is manifest in the universe, and during the night, life is dormant. Now, if we carefully study the Vedic cosmological calendar, we'll see that the current day of Brahma, the one we're in right now, began about two billion years ago. So, a Vedic archaeologist might expect to find evidence for a human presence going back almost two billion years. Now the ancient Vedic writings also speak of ape men. Uh, the idea of ape men wasn't invented by European scientists of the 19th century. Long before that, uh, the authors of these ancient Sanskrit writings were speaking of such things. But uh, they also tell us that alongside these ape men existed human beings like us. So the basic picture that you get is one of coexistence, not evolution. And the period of coexistence goes very, very, very far back in time. Of course, these ideas are somewhat different from the ideas about human origins and antiquity that we get from uh, Charles Darwin and his modern followers. Actually, a friend of mine from India told me recently, said, Michael, maybe you're a reincarnation of Charles Darwin. <laughs> You've had to come back to correct your mistake. So uh, I don't know if I can do it in one lifetime. <laughs> it may take me a few hundred or so, but maybe you can help me out a little bit. So what do the Darwinists tell us about uh, human origins? Well, first of all, they say that life began on Earth uh, between two and three billion years ago. Some scientists say they can detect chemical signs of life going back about three billion years. But the oldest undisputed fossil evidence uh, for life that paleontologists now have, uh, fossils of undisputed single-cell creatures, go back about two billion years, which is, interestingly enough, the beginning of the day of Brahma. <clears throat> Then they say the first 
uh, primates, the first apes and monkeys, came into existence about 40 million years ago. Uh, then they say the first hominids, the first ape men, came into existence about 6 million years ago. And finally they say that humans of our type, anatomically modern humans, came into existence about 100,000 years ago. At least that's the, old, the age of the oldest undisputed uh, fossil evidence for anatomically modern humans in terms of what modern archaeologists think is true. <clears throat> And they say all of the physical evidence supports this evolutionary picture of human origins with you know, human beings like us coming into existence between, uh, between 100 or 150,000 years ago, something like that. <clears throat> but you know, when I did eight years of research into the entire history of archaeology, you know, I found something quite different. I found that over the past 150 years, Archaeologists have discovered huge amounts of evidence showing that humans like us have existed throughout this entire period of time, going all the way back to the very beginning of the history of life on Earth. This evidence takes the form of anatomically modern human skeletal remains, anatomically modern human footprints, and human artifacts of various kinds. Yeah, I've documented this evidence in uh, this book, Forbidden Archaeology, co-authored with my co-author, Richard Thompson. Uh, it's a 900-page book, basically aimed at the scientific world. Uh, the book is also available in a shorter, popular edition, which is also available in French. It's been published in French uh, in, in Europe by the publisher Rocher, so you could get it on, if you like French, if you prefer French as your primary language, uh, it's available on the French Amazon.com. <clears throat> now, this evidence for extreme human antiquity, which contradicts the current theories, is not very well known, both within the scientific world and uh, to the public at large because of what I call a process of knowledge filtration that operates in the world of science. <clears throat> we can call this blue box here the knowledge filter, and it represents the current consensus on human origins. And reports of evidence that conform to this consensus will pass through this social and intellectual filter very easily, which means students will read about this evidence in their textbooks, um, People will hear scientists speaking about it on television. If they go to the local museum of natural history, they'll see the artifacts and bones on display. But if we have reports that radically contradict this current consensus, they tend to be filtered out of the discussion, which means we don't read about this evidence in our textbooks. We don't hear scientists speaking very much about it. And if we go to the museum, we won't see the artifacts or bones on display, although they may be there somewhere in uh, the museum collection. And I'm not talking here about some satanic conspiracy theory. Uh, it's a very well-known, well established fact among historians, philosophers, and sociologists of science that theory determines how evidence is treated. And what I've simply done is demonstrate how that process operates in archaeology and human origin studies generally. So what I'd like to do now is give a few representative examples of the kinds of evidence that I'm talking about. I want to show two things. First of all, that this evidence actually does exist. And I also want to say something about how the knowledge filtering process operates in, in each case. <clears throat> So I'm going to start with evidence that's relatively close to what many scientists are now prepared to accept in terms of human antiquity. And then gradually we'll go back further and further and further in time. <clears throat> and some of these, as, as I said, this knowledge filtering process has been going on for a long time. So some of the cases I'm going to talk about are from the more recent history of archaeology. Some of the cases will be from uh, the earlier history of archaeology. <clears throat> Uh, this is Virginia Steen McIntyre. She's an American geologist who I know personally. 
When she was a young woman, just beginning her career in archaeology, she was involved in dating an archaeological